Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar Antimicrobial Resistance, the Environmental Impact. My name is Adela Magyar, I am the Pharmaceuticals Policy Officer at Healthcare Without Harm Europe and I will be your moderator today. We are very pleased to collaborate together between Healthcare Without Harm Europe and Healthcare Without Harm Asia. We have over 90 people from over 20 countries who registered to participate in Healthcare Without Harm's webinar on antimicrobial resistance. We are delighted to have all of you and I'm sure this will be worth your time today. For those of you who don't know Healthcare Without Harm, well, Healthcare Without Harm celebrates its 20th anniversary this year. We are an international coalition that works to transform the healthcare sector worldwide without compromising patient safety or care so that it becomes ecologically sustainable and the leading advocate for environmental health and justice. We have offices in Southeast Asia, Latin America, Europe, and in the US. And also we have strategic partners in Brazil, in Australia, in India, South Africa, and China. Our work is based on the assumption that every person should have the right to environmental health and access to health care. We need to ensure that people live in a healthy environment and once they fall sick, they have access to proper health care and therapy. This webinar will include three speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Johan Benson Palm, who is a researcher at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Dr. Benson Palm holds a PhD on the effects of antibiotics in the environment uh, for Professor Joachim Larsen. I'm sure you all know Professor Larsen, especially from his TEDx speech. Uh, the research of Dr. Benson Palm covers the relative impacts of antibiotics from different sources, spanning investigation of aquatic environments, sewage and sewage treatment plants, as well as pharmaceutical pollution. In 2014, he and his colleagues presented an unprecedented diversity of antibiotic resistance factors in an Indian lake subjected to dumping with pharmaceutical pollution. Many of these uh, resistance factors seem to be easily transferable to human pathogens, and I'm sure Dr. Benson Palm will tell us more in his presentation about this. Our second presenter is uh, Mr. Lucas Viarda, who is the Global Marketing Director and Head of Sustainable Antibiotics Program at DSM Sinochem Pharmaceuticals. As head of the Sustainable Antibiotics Program, of a leading generic manufacturer of sustainable antibiotics, Lucas has long been vocal on the responsibility the industry should take in combating antimicrobial resistance and in keeping existing antibiotics effective. He played a key role in the establishment of the United Nations General Assembly Industry Roadmap on combating antimicrobial resistance that was signed and published uh, by 13 leading pharmaceutical companies in September 2016. He is committed to further raise awareness on the need to manufacture antibiotics responsibly and take leadership to make it happen. Lucas holds an executive master in finance and control from Amsterdam Business School and a master in finance from the University of Amsterdam. He has nearly two decades of working experience and joined DSM Sinochem Pharmaceuticals in January 2009. Prior to this, he fulfilled various functions within the publishing sector and worked on a voluntary basis as program director for the United Nations World Food Program in Bangladesh. And our last presenter today is Sister Marceline Jabel, who is a pharmacist at St. Paul Hospital, Kavait in the Philippines. Sister Marceline is a pharmacist with a BS in pharmacy from the University of the Immaculate Conception in Davao City. Uh, she is currently also studying towards a master's in hospital administration from St. Paul University in Manila. From 1996 to 2000, Sister Marceline did her religious formation at the Sisters of St. Paul of Charte in Antipolo City. She has been a chief pharmacist 
at St. Paul Hospital Cavite since 2006 and has also worked at Perpetual Sukor Hospital in Cebu City, St. Paul's Hospital in Iloilo, and the Maria Reina Hospital in Cagayan de Oro City. Uh, there will be um, time uh, during the webinar if you encounter problems uh, with your uh, audio system or have a question for a speaker, please write it in the chat box at questions. Please uh, remember that all participants will be automatically muted during this session. So again, welcome to you all and to our distinguished speakers. And with that, I would like to give the word to our first speaker, Dr. Johan benson Pal. Thank you, Adela. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, I am happy to have this opportunity to talk to you today. And my name is, as mentioned, Johan Bengtsson Palme. I work in the group of Professor Joachim Larsson here in Gothenburg. And this in this presentation, I will outline the findings of the group on antibiotic pollution from manufacturing and how that influences antibiotic resistance. Uh, there has been many people involved in these studies, and some of the studies actually predate uh, my time in the group. So when I say we, I generally <laughs> refer to we as the group, not that I have been specifically involved in every study that I talk about. And we will begin in India, and more specifically in the Patanjali area close to Hyderabad. And this area is one of the world's main pharmaceutical production hub hubs. And the reason why we have been studying this area intensively is really that in 2006, uh, we, we sampled a wastewater treatment plant that was receiving wa wastewater from around 90 different bulk drug, bulk drug producers. And this treatment plant, uh, it does a pretty much a biological treatment process that is not specifically adapted to take care of antibiotics or pharmaceuticals and it then re releases the treated water into the Isakavagi stream. And when we were doing chemical analysis of this water, we found very high concentrations of many pharmaceuticals in the effluent and very many different kinds of pharmaceuticals. And uh, there was one person who, walked with, who worked with these samples who referred to it that you almost have an ent entire pharmacy in here. And what I would like to highlight here is really the exceptional concentrations of ciprofloxacin in here. And ciprofloxacin is an, a broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, these concentrations are of around, three, around 30 milligrams per liter. It's actually higher, and this is in the effluent, this is higher than you have in the blood when you are being treated with this drug. Uh, that means that from one pipe from this wastewater treatment plant, you have a release of 44 kilograms of ciprofloxacin in a single day. And to put that in some perspective, Sweden's daily consumption of ciprofloxacin is nine kilograms. So this is five times the entire consumption of Sweden that comes out from a single pipe. And in the sediments downstream of the treatment plant, we found one gram per kilogram of sediment of ciprofloxacin. So this drug is so abundant in this sediment, so if it wasn't so cheap to produce it, you could probably mine it from the sediments downstream of the treatment plant. Furthermore, in the area around this, surface water is also polluted with different drugs, primarily ciprofloxacin, but also other drugs we could detect, uh, and so is also the groundwater. And this leads to that we can detect microgram per liter concentrations of ciprofloxacin in the wells that they use for drinking water at the time. And this, of course, leads us to the next question. Is the release of antibiotics in the environment, into the environment a problem? And this is a problem, of course, locally for many reasons, but it's also a global problem, and particularly it's a global problem because of one reason, and that is the development of antibiotic resistance. And Antibiotic resistance can develop through two main mechanisms. The first is that it can develop through mutations in the bacteria's own DNA. Um, so the small changes that make the bacteria more apt to handle the antibiotic. The second mechanism uh, is that bacteria can take up an entirely new gene from another bacteria, which suddenly renders it 
resistant to the antibiotic. And this is because bacteria has this peculiar property that they can share DNA with, with each other, particularly if they are closely related. And what happens when bacteria are stressed is that this ability to share DNA with each other is induced, which means that they are more likely to share the resistance genes that they carry with other bacteria that previously did not carry those resistance genes. Uh, and antibiotic is a stressor that induces this, even at concentrations that are way below the concentrations that actually kills the bacteria. So it means that even at low concentrations of, the anti of antibiotics, they might start sharing resistance genes with each other. Also, uh, resistance genes seem to be present in virtually every environment, but most of the time they are present in bugs that are completely harmless to us. So it doesn't really concern us. The problem is that when resistance genes are being shuffled around like this, um, the environment suddenly acts as a large source for resistance genes that can later be, be recruited into human pathogens and cause problems at the hospitals. So what happens here, you have to imagine here that you see a number of bacteria and that the blue ones are sens uh, sensitive to the antibiotic and can be killed and the red ones have a resistance gene that make them uh, impossible to kill with this antibiotic. And when you add the antibiotic to this community of bacteria, only the red ones survive. So only the resistance ones will survive antibiotic treatment, which also means that they can uh, spread an increase in numbers relative to the sensitive ones. So every time you use an antibiotic, you increase the number of resistant bacteria that comes out and survive. So given the situation around the wastewater treatment plant in Patanchiru, can we see any evidence for selection of resistant bacteria? And it turns out that we can. When we were investigating the bacteria that was isolated from this wastewater treatment plant, most were resistant to more than 20 different antibiotics. And some were resistant to every single antibiotic that we tested. One of the most resistant isolates, we selected that one and we used DNA sequencing to look at what kind of resistance mechanisms it carried. And that way we could confirm that some of the resistance genes had been acquired from other bacteria to this one. And some resistance mechanisms were due to that it has mut had mutated its own DNA so that it was better at handling antibiotics. Still, there were some part of this resistance pattern that we could not explain using DNA sequencing. And that means, or it suggests, that there could actually be yet unknown resistance mechanisms present here that we have not seen in pathogens yet. So furthermore, we investigated uh, lakes in the surrounding area that had been subjected to dumping of pharmaceutical waste uh, or waste from pharmaceutical production. And in these lakes, we could find very high proportions of resistant isolates compared to non-polluted Indian lakes and Swedish lakes. And you can see the results from the Swedish lakes to the left. And in the middle, you have the two uh, Indian lakes that have not been subjected to uh, dumping of pharmaceutical waste. And to the right, you have the two lakes that had been subjected to dumping. And you see that there is an immense difference between those When we specifically started looking for antibiotic resistance genes, we used DNA sequencing of the entire set of bacteria, every bacteria in the river sediment downstream of this wastewater treatment plant. So we used the technology where you take all the DNA and you look through it and try to find if there's resistance genes in that DNA. And this way we saw that downstream of the wastewater treatment plant, we have several percent of the genes that we could find were resistance genes. Um, so, and compare, if you compare that to the samples upstream, you see that you have much, much lower numbers. However, this study was done using a sequencing technique that is, was pretty old with today's standards. So it only really scratched the surface of what was in the uh, river sediment. 
So instead, we used a more modern, modern sequencing technology, and we went to sequence the DNA from one of these polluted lakes. And we compared those findings to what we find in a Swedish lake, just to have a little bit of a um, comparison to see what does a non-polluted lake look like. And you have the results from the Indian lake here in red and from the Swedish lake in blue. And as you can see, we have much, much higher abundances of resistance genes in the Indian lake that has been subjected to, polluted, um, to pollution from uh, pharmaceutical production. Actually, it's around 7,000 times more resistance genes in the Indian lake compared to the Swedish one. And the Swedish one, I would sort of treat like background. This is what you would normally find anywhere, I guess. And, but what I think is really striking in this picture is that we have such a huge diversity of resistance genes. And this, this happens despite that the only antibiotic that we could detect in the lake water was fluoroquinolones. But as you can see in this picture, there are many different drugs many different antibiotics that we find resistance genes against. So the bacteria seem to be resistant to much, much more different resistance genes than what we could find antibiotics, than the current responding antibiotics could be found in the lake. In addition, we also found that there were large abundances of genes and the genetic systems that help bacteria to share genes with each other. So this means that the bacteria in this lake has not only acquired a vast arsenal of antibiotic resistance genes, they also know how to share those genes with each other. So in essence, this creates a veritable melting pot for resistance development, where they have a lot of resistance genes to, to work with as a material, and they can also share the genes with each other when antibiotic selection is applied. And perhaps even more troublingly, when we took bacteria from this lake, we could transfer those resistance genes from the bacteria in the lake to human pathogens in the lab. And those pathogens could potentially cause disease. This means that the resistance genes that exist in this lake is actually pretty close to take the step from, the, from harmless environmental bacteria to dangerous bacteria, or they might actually have already done it. And we also know from other studies of ours that antibiotic resistance genes can be spread around the world by travel, even in healthy individuals. So this means that resistance is, uh, the resistance in this lake could actually be only hours away on an airplane. And it really highlights how the resistance problem is a truly global issue that we need to, to treat globally. Now, even if known resistance genes are the ones that are easiest to look for, most of those have already been found in pathogens. This is where the, how they were discovered initially. And in a sense, we argue that those genes are already being shared between pathogens in humans and in animals. So in a way, what's really scary is when you have resistance mechanisms in the environment that has not been uh, discovered in pathogens yet, or are, that are not common in pathogens yet, because those could actually be recruited from the environment into pathogens and cause uh, treatment failure in the future. So we argue that the risks could actually be larger with those genes. So what can we do about this problem? Well, there is a number of actions that we think would be needed. And one of them, many of them also, of course, boils down to the producers of drugs. And one, one action that would be really powerful, we think, is to start considering resistance development in the treatment of antibiotic production waste uh, so that you have, for example, disinfection of effluent, which would kill off the bacteria that potentially develop in the process before they are released into the environment. Of course, you could also work with non-toxic effluents, um, so that you 
uh, but, but but that's a much more broad um, action to take. We also think it would be very important to define discharge limits for antibiotics. And we actually suggested some concentrations of antibiotics for 111 different antibiotics uh, that could be used to implement discharge limits. And those were actually highlighted by uh, the final report from the AMR review committed by the British government, where they say that a good starting point for such standards might be a recent study done by us which proposed maximum limits for concentrations of common antibiotics in water. And this report also says that we need to improve standards for waste management to avoid scenarios where high concentrations of antibiotics are released into the environment. But they also highlight that it's important for the participants in the supply chain to act now to improve the transparency and the standards for how antibiotic waste is treated. And we really think that the transparency is an important issue here because as it is at the moment, it's really hard to know if a drug is produced in a good or a bad way when it comes to the environment. And in September this year, there was actually an industry initiative that highlighted um, the environment in uh, the role of the environment and the role of uh, pharmaceutical pollution in the antibiotic resistance development. And in this, in this um, industry road, roadmap, they write that they um, commit to review their own manufacturer and supply chain in order to assess good practice in controlling releases of antibiotics. They want to establish a common framework for managing antibiotic discharge. And they also say that they want to establish a science-driven risk-based targets for uh, discharge concentration of antibiotics. And this is a very good starting point. We think it's really, really good that the industry is starting to work with this, but we think that it's not enough. Because what, what's at stake here is really too important to only let the industry regulate and review itself. We think that it's also very important to have legislation in place and other incentives, uh, and that those cannot really be replaced by this industry effort that some part, players in the industry might not even follow. We need to follow this up with uh, legislation and other requirements on pharmaceutical productions. So what kind of incentives could we create? Well, one thing we could do is to involve environmental criteria in the procurement of medicine or criteria where um, resistance development is actually considered. We could also use tax substitution to push environmentally friendly drugs rather than just pushing the cheapest possible drug, which is done currently in Sweden. And we could also amend the good manufacturing uh, practice to require minimal standards for antibiotic releases and, and uh, the treatment of antibiotic production waste. And these are questions that we are working with within, newly, in, within the newly funded Center for Antibiotic Resistance Research at the University of Gothenburg. Um, which is an interdisciplinary center with 50 different research groups. And we work with what kind of incentives we can, um, we can implement and what kind of effects those different incentives and uh, actions would, be, take, would uh, mean for, uh, what, what effects they would have on resistance development. So finally, we just would like to acknowledge my uh, former PhD supervisor, Professor Joachim Larsson, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be here today and also all the members, current and former, of his research group that has contributed to all these studies. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Johan benson Pan, for this uh, interesting presentation. I remind all participants that there will be time uh, for questions and answers uh, following the three presentations. Uh, and now uh, we will move from the scientific view to the industry perspective, and for this, I will give the word to Mr. Lucas Viarda. Thank you, Adela, for um, giving us, me, the opportunity and present um, our concern and the actions we take as a company in our, in, to, the, to the combat um, of antimicrobial resistance. And thank you so much, Johan, for uh, your excellent 
presentation and explanation of this critical issue. My name is indeed Lucas Bijarda. I'm the Global Marketing Director and Head of the Sustainable Antibiotics Program of DSM Sinecam Pharmaceuticals, and I would like to start with a personal note. Since I cannot imagine a world without effective antibiotics. Nine years ago, I got hit by a sepsis, also called a blood infection. I was hospitalized, spent a few days in the intensive care, but especially the four months after this hospitalization, I lived in great uncertainty since the protein levels in my blood were not under control, showing that the bacterial infection was still there. Thanks to the effectiveness of antibiotics, I am able to give this presentation during this webinar. And so I basically owe my life to effective antibiotics. Also, I'm grateful to these antibiotics that worked since they managed or they helped me to find the love of my life, which is on the right of this slide, and brought life to my son, which is today seven years old. So this is my personal driver to do everything possible, everything in my power to keep antibiotics effective today and for my son, my spouse, my family and friends. Knowing that the pipeline of new antibiotics or alternatives is rather thin and full of uncertainties. Now I can imagine that most participants in this webinar think DSM Sinechem Pharmaceuticals, what company is that? So please allow me to briefly introduce the company I work for. We were amongst the first companies that scaled up penicillin in the 1940s. Today, we um, are amongst the largest antibiotic manufacturers of sustainable antibiotics and some other compounds in which we apply green enzymatic technology wherever we can. Um, we do that in facilities and plants that we run all over the world. We operate factories in India, China, Mexico, and Europe. And all these factories we run according to three basic requirements that, according to us, are necessary to make antibiotics responsibly. We use the cleanest technology, enzymatic in our case. We run wastewater treatment plants 24-7, 365 days per year at all our sites, and we apply antimicrobial activity testing to ensure that the effluent we discharge into the environment is clean. We do that because we don't want to contribute to AMR. On the contrary, we are in the business to fight bacterial infections, and we do not want to make them stronger nor resistant. Now, I think uh, every, all the participants in this web, uh, webinar know these slides showing the uh, very concerning estimates that were shared by the AMR review, basically stating that by 2050, my son at that time will be of my age, around 10 million people annually will pass away due to the fact that if antibiotics could eventually become ineffective if we do not act today. The economic um, value that will be destroyed is showing a value which is difficult to imagine. It shows that our society will look completely different as, we, um, well, yeah, as, as today. And even today, many, people's, many people already die because of ineffective antibiotics that are not made available for them. I think most of us also know the causes, the drivers behind AMR. Obviously, in the public debate, much reference is made to the overuse of antibiotics by humans, 
the misuse of antibiotics in the agriculture sector, sector. And more recently, a third driver has been added to this, namely the antibiotic pollution, not only by natural excretion, but also um, antibiotic pollution associated with the manufacturing of it. And I'm happy that also Healthcare Without Harm is stressing this issue on its website, stating that there is increasing evidence that shows that waste pharmaceuticals from excretion and disposal, including the effluent from pharmaceutical manufacturing process, is a concern in the development of resistance. Clearly, the University of Gothenburg, Johan and Joachim Larsen, played an important role in addressing this issue. But I think, especially over the last year, it surfaced really in the public debate on, AMR, the public debate on AMR, after the publication of the AMR review, the O'Neill inquiry, who said that it was an issue that has too often been neglected in the discussions about AMR. Also, they stressed that there is growing evidence of API manufacturers that do not adequately treat waste products with the result that bacteria become increasingly resistant. They even shared some concerning estimates that around 200 antibiotic production facilities, mainly located in India and China, where most of the antibiotics are made today, <coughs> release an estimated amount of 30,000 to 70,000 tons of antimicrobial active waste into the environment. And the largest forms comes with it in liquid form, the effluent, around 95%. Now the question then is, why would we as a company care? Now first, as explained, we have personal drivers, me as a person as a, and as a father of my son. Second, <coughs> We know that antibiotics form a cornerstone of the health system we know today. Not only it cures us from simple bacterial infections such as pneumonia or sepsis, it's not simple. Also it is needed for caesareans, organ transplants and even cancer treatments. And second of course, if antibiotics become ineffective, we as a company can wind up our business since our products are useless. And that is why we have defined the Sustainable Antibiotic Program to position ourselves um, in the global debate on AMR. Now, is it an issue that, can, that is solved easily? No, it is in fact quite difficult, but not impossible. If all the supply chain partners take their responsibility and ownership to solve it, then I'm sure and confident that we can tackle this pressing issue. But supply chain partners from ingredient manufacturers to buyers and all the partners that are in between should take their responsibility, including also all the institutes and entities that are somehow influencing our supply chain, such as regulators, policy makers, industry associations, and NGOs. Since still quite some things need to be done. Audit trails from drug products to ingredients need to be generated in an industry which is bound together with many subcontracting activities. Tolerance levels for antibiotic discharge needs to be defined. Auditing frameworks to include, that, that should include antibiotic discharge levels need to be established. But maybe even most important, and I think Johan also referred to it, is an incentive or penalty system needs to be established to support environmental responsible manufacturing. 
And also environmental criteria should be included in decisions of buyers and purchasers. And environmental criteria should be included in tender policies. On top of it, of course, it would be very helpful if a company rating could be introduced to measure the performance on AMR of every single company we have in this world, and which inherently is established to care, to cure, and to do good. Now, as also referred to by, uh, by Johan, the AMR review uh, in its last publication, May 2016, came up with a number of recommendations which also impacted the manufacturing of antibiotics. They called for evidence-based antibiotic discharge levels to be defined. They basically said that manufacturing standards needs to be introduced to make antibiotics responsibly. They focused on increasing transparency in the value chain by, for instance, a quality mark or an industry label. And environmental criteria had to be included in sourcing policies. These recommendations were presented to the G20, but also to the General Assembly of the United Nations on AMR, held in September in New York. After the publication of these recommendations or interventions, a, number of, or a large number of other stakeholders also started to get focal on this issue. Not only the United Nations touched upon this in its political declaration, also recently the WHO, and we are pleased to hear that, announced that a research agenda to collect evidence on the importance of antibiotic residues and resistant organisms should be or would be organized. And that is important. Equally important is that other stakeholders, such as investors, institutional investors such as Nordea, but also BNP Paribas, started to share their concerns, not only with the public, but also to the companies where they invest in. And finally, NGOs like Healthcare Without Harm, but also Changing Markets, the European Public Health Alliance, Waxman, and many others, including also Access to Medicines, who is working on an index to rate companies on, AMR, uh, on their AMR performance, uh, do a very good job and are instrumental in addressing this important issue. And even though we do not always agree with the tone of voice of these stakeholders or how they package their message, we share the same concern. And as explained earlier, according to us, antibiotics should be made responsibly. This means that we call the pharmaceutical industry already for a few years to stop buying, using and selling irresponsibly made antibiotics. And for us, the responsible manufacturing means use the cleanest technology, apply wastewater treatment plants at every site that is making antibiotics and run these wastewater treatment plants 24-7, 365 days per year. And finally, monitor by implementing antimicrobial activity tests the effluent that is disposed into the environment. And we are not afraid for new legislation that indeed needs to be implemented or self-regulation that can be initiated by the industry. And in fact, Johan also referred to this already, we are very pleased, happy and proud that we are no longer the only company that is focal on this topic, but that we got the support from 30, 12 other leading pharmaceutical companies that share the same concern and desire as we do. In the industry roadmap presented on September 21st, these companies, among other commitments such as uh, focusing on the excess use of antibiotics, the access to effective antibiotics, and new collaboration forms, plus the need to, man uh, to develop new antibiotics and alternatives, uh, we are very happy that they also prioritized the environmental impact of antibiotics manufacturing. 
and especially um, the last one was presented as the first bullet in this industry roadmap and helped us to well, yeah, start working on this issue together. And I'm very proud that many initiatives have been taken since September 21st by, amongst others, the Pharmaceutical Supply Chain Initiative, the um, um, Inter-Association Initiative, uh, Pharmaceuticals in the uh, Environment, to start increasing standards. A number of work groups have been met already, um, uh, work groups that discuss the topic and focus to define solutions with not only one company but many companies together. Also more companies wish to sign up for the roadmap, including larger generic companies, while uh, a number of buyers quite recently showed increased receptiveness and engagement to this important topic or issue. And I'm really hope I'm, I am hopeful that uh, soon uh, new results will be reported in our joint combat on AMR. And that is needed. Because if we want to conserve existing antibiotics today and for next generations to come, we should all, every single individual, company or supply chain uh, partner, we should all take, use and make antibiotics responsibly. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Viarda. We will move on and I will give the word to Sister Marceline, who will present a case study from a hospital in the Philippines. Good day, everyone. I was tasked to share on our practice of drug recall here at St. Paul Hospital Cavite. But before that, I'd like to define first what is this drug recall all about. Meaning to say, I will be presenting all the drugs, not only for antibiotics. What is drug recall? This is according to US FDA. Drug recall are actions taken by the firm to remove a product from the market because it's either defective or potentially harmful, or for its proper disposal. Recalls can be conducted by firms on initiatives, or by FDA request, or by FDA order under statutory authority. This is still according to the US FDA, meaning to say it is an intervention done by the firm to ensure medication safety. What are the products for drug recall? Here are number one products for drug recall are near expiry drugs. It is our policy to recall drugs, especially from emergency carts and the different nursing units, near expiry drugs at least one month before its expiry date. Number two, suspected adulterated drugs. These drugs usually are syrups and injectables with, with foreign particles, or when used, it does not give its desired efficacy. Number three, drugs and medical supplies not properly sealed. These are drugs or supplies which upon delivery, the seal were destroyed or the label are not correct. Number four, drugs with adverse reaction. These are drugs when used will bring about undesirable effects other than its therapeutic value. 
Number five, drugs declared by companies for drug recall. These are drugs which distributors or manufacturing companies will recall because it's of its questionable efficacy and label. These are the following policies in St. Paul Hospital, Cavite. Distributors, distributors or companies should be informed first regarding the status of their products. We call for any representative of the company or distributor if good manufacturing practice were not observed, like if the seal were destroyed or there are breakages upon delivery. Number two, for any adverse drug event, an investigation will be conducted through the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. In cases where there is an adverse drug event, a report should be made by the unit concerned using a form provided by the Food and Drug Administration. Then the members of the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee will convene and investigate after which a summary of the decision will be made, then submit them to the Food and Drug Administration Office. After the decision has been made, the company concerned will be called for if proven that there was negligence in the manufacturing or even in the handling of drugs during deliveries. Procedures. Products for drug recall should be placed in a separate shelf properly labeled to avoid dispensing. A particular shelf is provided within the pharmacy away from the dispensing area. Usually these are near expiry drugs. Number two, distributors, companies should be called for to check the products and retrieve, retrieve particular invoice. A duplicate copy of invoices were given upon delivery. One copy will be for the finance department and one copy will be kept for us so that when there is a recall, we present this invoice vis-a-vis with a product to be recalled. Number three, investigation and confirmation will be done by the company. Once the product were retrieved by the company, they will investigate and confirm the de defect of the certain product. Or if it's near expiry, they will check it all with the invoice provided. After the confirmation, a report will be furnished in two copies for the company and one for the chief pharmacist before the product is recalled. Number five, following the return and refund policy, the company has to refund the drugs or products recalled. These products are in cases of expiry drugs they will replace the same quantity recalled with a new one, which has later expiry date. For the compliance, I just uh, made a tabulation for the year 2016. Uh, it shows there, there are three products and two of them are antibiotics. For the number one, uh, four bottles of butyl guaifenesin, one milligram per 50 milligram per 5 ml, expectorant 60 ml, expiry date it was October 2016, and the date recalled September 2016. For the next one, 
The product is coamoxiclub, 4 bottles coamoxiclub, 156.25 mg per 5 ml, 60 ml. Expiry date is still October 2016 and it was recalled September 2016. The last one is chlorithromycin, a macrolide, 125 mg per 5 ml, 25 ml. The expiry date is October 2016 and it was recalled 2016. Most of our expiry drugs were really taken by the company. We usually before, we usually destroyed or, or do it uh, by dissolving it in water. But now, because we are being trained and we are informed, especially that we are partners with uh, Healthcare Without Harm, that for expiry drugs, we really have to return it to the company or the distributor or the manufacturing firm. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Marceline, for this uh, presentation. We have uh, time for questions, and we have quite a few. Uh, the first question is uh, for uh, all the three speakers. So we know that um, when we discuss antimicrobial resistance, there has been uh, lots of actions taken at uh, both at local and international level. We have a global action plan from World Health Organization. We have uh, EU Council recommendation at the EU level. We have uh, the European Action Plan. We have European Commission guidelines. We have European Parliament resolutions, then several international reports uh, on the economic impact of AMR. We have the Transatlantic Task Force, and uh, still things are getting worse. Uh, one participant is telling us that they have also major problems in Nepal. Who is responsible for this? Why this situation? If uh, all speakers can share their view about this. Uh, yes, I can. Um, Lucas Viara here. Uh, so indeed, uh, I recognize the fact that, that all kinds of good initiatives are taken by several institutes global, on the global level, regional level, local level. Um, I, I have read the uh, Global Action Plan of the WHO. We know that the United Nations came up with a political declaration on AMR, which basically um, uh, states that every country should make a country plan on AMR. Um, so there are all kinds of mechanisms um, put in place. Also the industry uh, is mobilizing efforts as indicated by the PSEI, the Pharmaceutical Supply Chain Initiative, but also with other um, um, yeah, initiatives. But indeed, and I do recognize that, a global platform that is coordinating all the efforts and actions that are needed is lacking. There's also one of the things that the um, industry roadmap outlined that we, as 13 signatory companies, would support uh, global coordination of um, all the actions that, uh, that, that needs to be taken um, and to uh, organize this multi stakeholder dialogue that is necessary. Uh, but I think uh, there is a role for the global institutes like the United Nations, like the WHO, um, to um, yeah, come up with uh, such a platform that uh, coordinates um, uh, our actions and topics, which is not yet the case. Okay. Dr. Benson Palm, do you have uh, something to share with us about this? I think that Duke has already touched upon this, and, and the it's when it when it comes to the problem with with pharmaceutical pollution or pollution from manufacturing, uh, the industry has a very important role, and it's really really nice to see that it's there's some action taken there. But as I as I said, I think that there's there's a risk of letting the industry lead that work themselves, um, and think that. Okay, now they have taken 
<laughs> they are uh, at the steering wheel and we can just sit back and, and help, help let them solve them themselves because there will always be players in the industry that does not care about these issues. And uh, I think it's very important that we pick that up and create incentives, that the public create incentives for clean production and for, um, and, and that could be both in terms of uh, legislation and putting up rules and systems that demand certain lowest standards, but it could also be uh, as part of um, substitution systems and uh, as um, uh, for having um, uh, tax reductions on certain drugs uh, that are produced in an environmentally friendly way, which in turn, I mean, by environmentally friendly, we also come back, of course, to human health, especially with the and antibiotic resist resistance issues. So I think, to a large extent, the ball is still with uh, the public and um, the politicians, and the um, we, we need to set the agenda so that everyone has a level playing field, uh, so that it is not so we don't so we don't give the ball to the industry and say that it's really good that you started this work, now you solve it because if there is someone who plays on the side by that, and we haven't changed the rules, in Sweden, for example, we would still be required to buy the cheapest drug, despite that a large part of the industry would uh, go for a more environmentally friendly production. So I think this is, um, this is a very, it's, it's very important that the industry and the public work uh, at the same time, so that we don't just leave the topic to them. Thank you, Sister Marceline. For us, in the micro level and in the local area, especially in our institution as a hospital, concerted efforts must really be implemented. Um, the proper waste management, especially as I talked earlier, as I mentioned earlier, that when there are antibiotics or drugs, we should not dispose them in our own sink or melt them or dissolve them in water, which we usually practice before, and which eventually will, do, will go into stream, river stream, and which will pollute the environment. So awareness, concerted effort, proper waste management is very important to solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Marceline, and uh, all the two other speakers uh, for this view. We will uh, move on uh, with the questions and answers for 10 more minutes. If some of the uh, participants uh, cannot uh, uh, stay with us, we, they will find uh, the uh, recording of this webinar on Healthcare Without Harm's uh, website. Um, another uh, question is uh, for Dr. Benson Pyle. Uh, why do you focus uh, on India? Uh, do you have uh, any data from China? We, uh, we don't have any data from China within our own group. We have been working pretty much with India because, because, of, uh, um, because this is where the work started. Uh, there are other people who have been working with Chinese production. There are a number of, number of um, Chinese groups that have been publishing um, regarding pharmaceutical releases from production in China. Um, I don't think that the literature is... There's not as much studies done in China, but there are studies done in China as well, but not by us. Um, then, um, of course, the, fo the focus on India uh, is also because of because the it is one of the large one of the largest producers of uh, bulk drugs in the world uh, together with China. So it would make sense to look for, uh, at production in China as well. But we have not done that in our group specifically. Okay. Um, yeah, if I may yeah. add to that, uh, um, on slide number eleven of my presentation, uh, the presentation of DSM Sinochem Pharmaceuticals, we indeed have provided the um, uh, also another 
uh, University or the Chinese Academy of Sciences and Environmental Science and Technology, um, which have been working quite hard to map antibiotic concentrations and discharges in Chinese waterways. And what they found were similar to uh, the findings of uh, the, the University of Gothenburg, very high concentrations of antibiotics in the waterways. So if uh, you would like to uh, know a bit more on uh, the Chinese uh, situation, you can uh, direct these questions um, um, to us. I would also like to add one more thing to that, and that is that the literature overall, the scientific literature overall on uh, concentrations from pharmaceutical manufacturing is not that big. This is still a very much understudied issue. Uh, the, the really alarming thing is that almost every case report that you find reports pretty high concentrations. Um, so uh, compared to what you find in, in, in other environments, of course. So uh, I think I think it's it makes sense that there is not that much done uh, on uh, outside of India and China. Uh, thank you. Dr. Benson Pan, do you also engage with other academia, such as the University of Cambridge, who recently supported the studies on resistant bacteria found in India, or stakeholders such as WHO, who recently announced to start a research program to study the seriousness of the issue? We, yes, of, um, we, we of course have uh, collaborations outside of uh, the University of Gothenburg. Um, but we also we also work a lot with the stakeholders. We're working with Swedish stakeholders to um, to incorporate the environmental issues into the uh, procurement plans and into the um, pricing schemes that we we have. We have subsidies in Sweden for certain for certain pharmaceuticals, and we want to incorporate in the substitution system. And then we are also working with stakeholders on the European Union level. And the reason why I am here instead of uh, Professor Joachim Larsson today is actually that Joachim is visiting the VHO meeting in Geneva. So we, we are working with the VHO as well. Another question also for um, Dr. Benson Pine. What is the criteria for defining the standards for antibiotics, antimicrobials? Can you share the current defined standards? The standards for releases, or uh, I find the question a little bit unfair. I think yes. I think it refers to to discharges to releases. Yes. yes. Um, the 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 troubling thing is that the current currently there is not really a standard. Um, if you if you have a production facility that releases antibiotics into the environment, the only thing that you have to adhere to at the moment is the um, local regulations on uh, on environment uh, on environmental discharges which may look very different in different parts of the world um, for a long time it was thought that pharmaceutical releases from production was not really a problem because essentially it's releasing the active ingredient that you are producing and that would be uh, a stupid practice. It was thought for a long time, but it, apparently it's, it is a problem, and we, that has been increasingly clear for the last 10 years. And But this is one of the things that we are working with to try to actually put standards into place to define what what would be the the maximum concentration of pharmaceuticals that you can, or that would be, I shouldn't use the word safe, but that would be acceptable to um, uh, release into the environment. So this is one of the things that we are pushing with the stakeholders now to have that in place. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Mr. Viarda. Is there an increase in the price due to the processes used, uh, for example, the enzymatic filtration, et cetera, versus conventional methods, the process higher price, the, the percent of higher price? Um, now yeah, I think in general, uh, if people are concerned about the price, um, which should um, or could eventually be increased due to the need to
to implement responsible practices in the manufacturing of antibiotics. I think uh, it is important, first of all, to um, share that we are one of the leading manufacturers of antibiotics. <laughs> Apply all these processes and we are still competitive. So it proves that, that, that not in all co cases the costs need to go up if you make antibiotics in this case responsibly. Number two, if it would be that the costs would increase because we have to increase the standards in the industry, in the whole supply chain, that costs are in no way uh, as high as the economic cost of doing nothing um, come up to us. So even if um, the cost would increase, this is much on the short term or the mid term, this would be much less than the economic cost um, of not acting at all. And then, yeah, thirdly, uh, if you look at the, um, the, um, the area where antibiotic pollution is caused most in the value chain or in the supply chain, I think in the ingredients manufacturing, then uh, we should also understand that the active ingredients are in most of the cases not the cost driver of the formulation we take if we are sick. So if the ingredients would increase in price a bit, then most likely the consumer does not have to, or the insurance companies or the buyers, do ultimately um, not, not see that uh, significantly. Um, thank you. Also a question uh, uh, for Mr. Viarda. What are the wastewater treatment technologies that can be used to remove antibiotics from pharmaceutical industry wastewaters? What are the cost implications of treating pharmaceutical uh, wastewater to reduce antibiotic concentrations to acceptable levels? Yeah, um, very good question, uh, of course. Uh, the costs associated with uh, installing wastewater treatment plants uh, primarily can be split in two. And that is, first of all, the capital expenditures, eh, the cost that you make to install such uh, treatment plants, and on the other hand, the operational costs, the operational expenditures that you have to make to run these wastewater treatment plants 24-7, 365 days per year. Now, um, the technologies we use, without going into too much detail, um, are not uh, very revolutionary. Um, so uh, I think um, um, we, we, we just apply uh, different uh, forms of te different technologies to, cl to clean our effluent, but they are not very unique. Neither are our effluent treatment plants. Um, so. Yeah, everybody should do it against uh, reasonable costs. Uh, but the one who is asking this question, um, I'm inviting him or her to reach out to us and um, um, then we can start a dialogue uh, on this. Thank you. Another question also for you. Um, how much <laughs> of, a of a barrier to improvement will it be if there is no change in drug procurement practices by healthcare providers or governments, um, such as they continue to buy antibiotics from the cheapest supplier rather than uh, from those that produce antibiotics more responsibly. Uh, I think uh, this is one of the, um, the uh, mechanisms we are, uh, t first of all, trying to define and then we, uh, and then the next step after having defined uh, the mechanism with uh, both private and public stakeholders, um, these mecha mechanisms need to be implemented. I think both Johan and also me stressed that indeed it is important to uh, develop a mechanism that reasonably uh, rewards but also punishes uh, the manufacturing of um, antibiotics, but also, I think, pharmaceuticals in general. Uh, at this moment, it is not the case, so I think it is fair to say that there is the fair level playing field is lacking. And in order to solve this issue, 
uh, it just needs to be restored and then it will solve itself largely. So if manufacturers of antibiotics or pharmaceutical ingredients are incentivized to do the right thing, then clearly um, yeah, there is an economic motive to, to start acting on this. And then you also eliminate the free riders principle, which also Johan uh, touched upon, um, uh, because it becomes just more rewarding to act res and manufacture responsibly. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Sister Marceline. Are there already case studies in hospitals, clinics, or healthcare spots about good practices in managing antimicrobial resistance? And are there guidelines for healthcare professionals in AMR management? Yes, I believe, but for in the Philippines, there are a lot of research being done, especially in big hospitals and in big universities. Um, like, um, I remember uh, in St. Luke's Global, they have researches on um, antimicrobial resistance. And then they also made guidelines for that, but I cannot give it for you now. But it was presented to us when we had our internship there. Um, actually, the the importance of having the study on drug resistance in every institution is very important. Uh, we have we tie up with for for us our initiative here in St. Paul Hospital Cavite. We have this. Um, tie up with the laboratory, with the medical technologies for uh, studies on drug resistance every year. So that's for our own initiative here in St. Paul Hospital Cavite. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Benson Palm. Selection for resistance is only one impact of the antibiotic in the environment, whether from production or patient use. The PNAC uh, resistance proposed does not consider the impact of other important ecosystem services, such as bacterial, bio, geochemical cycles, cyanobacteria, daphnia, fish, uh, which can be lower. Uh, why just the focus on AMR? Will we miss other important impacts if we do not think more holistically? I think this is a very great question. Um, <clears throat> what uh, what the uh, the questioner is uh, uh, referring to is the concentrations we published last year, uh, where we suggested some concentrations that could be used to implement discharge limits. And for those, we were specifically uh, looking at the concentrations of antibiotics that could drive antimicrobial resistance. Um, <clears throat> but of course, uh, whoever asked this question is <clears throat> is right about that we do not specifically in this number consider uh, other endpoints such as um, ecosystem services was one thing that was mentioned. There was a, there was a lot of things mentioned that uh, that were not considered in that. Uh, what, however, when you look at where, where we where we end up with those concentrations and you compare that to what exists today in data on, on uh, toxicological effects in the environment, uh, we end up much lower in the vast majority of cases than an, any other effect concentrations. Um, particularly the concentrations that we predict would have an effect or would, um, would be above the no effect concentration we predict. Um, the concentrations that are um, uh, uh, let's see how to, how to phrase this. If, if you compare that, those concentrations, what we arrive at, uh, to the concentrations that are um, toxic or uh, cause decreased growth in fish or in um, daphnia, our concentrations are generally much lower. And they are also much lower than the toxicological tests used today to assess the environmental impact of pharmaceuticals, although that data is pretty scarce. So if I, 
if I'm allowed to guess, I would say that we, if if you would put the emission limits where we have suggested in this publication, uh, the other endpoints would probably not be that affected. That said, we have not, as correctly pointed out by the questioner, we have we have not considered that explicitly, and I would welcome to also have that data in the consideration about environmental effect because it's it's of course important if we establish such a framework for uh, pharmaceutical releases from production or from sewage treatment plants or whatever it's of course also important to look at the other effects uh, on non bacteria thank you another question also for you uh, what are your thoughts on the importance of cost selection and co-resistance? Metals and biocides have been in, implicated in the cost selection of AMR in the environment. Recent evidence shows that reductions in the veterinary use of antibiotics in Denmark have resulted in increased in AMR burdens as antibiotics have been replaced by metal use. Do we need to consider co-selective agents in risk management strategies? and environmental monitoring studies? Yes, uh, would be the short answer to that. That should be considered as well. Uh, however, as, as, the, as we currently, if we just going back for a moment to pharmaceutical production, it's more, I think it's more important to put any kind of standard into place on the antibiotics themselves than to start off or to delay that process by trying to include every possible co-selection substance because that will take years to understand. So I think as a first step, it's good to go for the uh, compounds that we are sure select for antibiotic resistance, which is the antibiotics themselves. But we are also in the group investigating uh, effects of uh, biocides and metals. And I think this is a very natural next step um, for um, uh, for screening of substances in the environment. Uh, however, it's a little bit of a different, well, it was a, li it's a little bit of a different question from what I presented today, uh, but it's still, of course, in a, in, a, in a long perspective and in a broad perspective, co-select, uh, substances that can co-select for antibiotic resistance, such as metals that has been increasingly, increasingly used in agriculture um, and biocides that are used to, um, clean surfaces and things like that, those compounds must also be considered in the long run. Thank you. And uh, one more question for uh, all the speakers, if possible. Um, how do they plan to reach out to countries to encourage them in participating? Also, how will monitoring be done in these countries to make sure this initiative is properly mobilized? Uh, now, for, uh, from an industry perspective, and uh, talking for DSM, Sarnik and Pharmaceuticals only, um, we uh, have concerted efforts uh, and we are continuously uh, maintaining the dialogue with several um, Ministries in especially China and India. Furthermore, we work uh, together with um, um, yeah, uh, public entities focusing on um, disease control, uh, not only in the Netherlands but also in, uh, in China. We organize uh, workshops with them. And uh, we also uh, hope. Um, with um, uh, that, that we uh, we will shortly become a member, we hope after passing all the criteria of the pharmaceutical supply chain initiative, which always main, which also maintains an active dialogue with uh, a number of um, stakeholders we have discussed. And by maintaining this dialogue, we hope that somehow we influence. Um, uh, policy makers and regulators to indeed do the needful. We ourselves, as said, primarily focus on um, the Netherlands, where we have uh, a number of plants, China, where we operate uh, huge plants, as well as 
India, and by doing that, we uh, try to influence the um, yeah the policies that are um, being put in place. We hope. I think, uh, if I may may continue here, I think that for for um, to to actually live up to standards that we that we um, pose, I think it's important, and I think this is something that really needs to be hammered in that. We need transparency, 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 uh, and at the moment, it's we have when we have these discussions with um, the, the Swedish representatives of the pharmaceutical industry, they say that they have problems disclosing or provi- uh, or pr- providing us with the right audits um, for the type of questions we would like to ask in procurement, for example, and this is. To, to some extent, it's an, it's an effect of that you have so many players within the pharmaceutical supply chain. Um, and some of those players are more prone to disclose their production, um, um, the, what they do with the production waste, how they produce the antibiotics, uh, and some of them are much less so. And I think it's important to, or it's actually instrumental to demand a larger degree degree of transparency because otherwise it's at least to towards the buyer because otherwise it will be impossible to actually see that the companies are doing what they claim they are doing and i think this is something that we will need to push harder and i think i, I would guess now that uh, uh, lucas uh, is, is on the side of the pharmaceutical industry that agrees with this, that this is necessary for leveling the playing field. Uh, thank you, Johan. Um, also regarding all, with what you just said, are there uh, screenings of antibiotic discharges and um, resistance occurrence also in the Western countries in Europe? Well, as I mentioned before, there is uh, there is pretty little done uh, outside of India and China on antibiotic releases from from, from uh, manufacturing. There are studies. Um, there is a study made in, or a case study, I should almost say, made in Norway uh, about 10 years ago where they uh, detected releases of uh, rifampicin, I think it was. Um, no, bacitracin it, it was. And then uh, uh, there have been um, Detections of pretty high levels of sulfonamide production waste in Croatia and in Denmark, uh, but these um, the the number of reports from from Europe is much more scarce. Um, I whether that reflects that the production practices are better, or whether it reflects that um, it's a very understudied subject is still open because. Uh, we, we essentially don't know if it's if it's a if it's an undersampling issue or if it's that production is slightly better. Thank you, uh, Sister Merceline. Do you want to add something? Yes. Um, in our local locality, I think uh, we should strengthen information dissemination regarding. <laughs> the initiatives of the different uh, companies and for the proper for us, proper waste management and follow up. And then to make or create a monitoring tool for proper waste management and see to it that it is well implemented. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And now at the end, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers for their great work and input today. And also, I would like to thank you all for choosing to join us. I look forward to continuing the conversation on antimicrobial resistance in our future events. Don't forget to follow us on noharmeurope.org, noharmasia.org, or noharmuscanada.org. Have a nice day, everyone, and goodbye.